Awesome. Okay. Hey, Angie. We're here talking about developmental relationships. Hi, Michael. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Good. So we're going to talk about developmental relationships. I'm going to just share a little presentation here and just say that feel free to reach out to us at this email if this information is of interest to you. And we are associated with Shift 314, which is uh, a new organization created by Michael and Audrey Sahota. We're talking about developmental relationships, and let's just start off by explaining what that is. A developmental relationship is a peer relationship in which both people are dedicated to supporting each other's growth. What does that mean to you, Angie? To me, it's it's more than a mentoring relationship. It's a personal um, growth journey almost I guess journey is probably the word that resonates with me <clears throat> having us be able to be completely honest and open um, and transparent and to kind of shine things on our edges that we don't necessarily see in ourselves I like all of that and I'll add that the phrase developmental relationship is I think new with this video so we're announcing that phrase to the world and the way that that came about is that I was thinking about some relationships that I've had over the last decade or so that were friendships and they were sometimes business colleagues, but calling them friendships and calling them business colleagues failed to capture what was actually going on. Yeah. And so the idea of developmental relationship, which is exactly as you said, a relationship which fosters personal growth is sort of a concept that we wanted to separate out. And so let's define or describe what the difference is between a, uh, a, a developmental relationship and a coaching relationship. So one similarity is that people in a coaching relationship also support each other. True. In development. And there are significant differences, though. One is that um, coaching relationships are typically not about giving advice. A coach is typically not giving advice to the other person, whereas that's certainly welcomed in the developmental relationship. Another big difference is that most of the coaching relationships I've been part of have been, say, one hour a week or one hour every two weeks, whereas developmental relationships involve hours and hours of time together. So you can capture and see each other's edges. So those are a couple. Oh, and then another big difference is that it's a peer relationship. Right? It's not a coach and a coachee. It's bilateral and in all ways. What do you think about that? I think one of the other differences that really pop out as you were kind of reading that, and I was listening to what you were saying, Michael, is the fact that um, in, when, you're, when we are working with people in the coaching position, we don't actually freely offer advice a lot of times. A lot of times what we're doing is asking people questions because we know that they know the answers and we want to help them process the information that they have to understand that they know how to get where they want to go without having to ask somebody else for the answers. And in this particular relationship, it's we are freely giving that advice because what we're doing is we're monitoring each other, right? constantly listening and listening to the system and seeing how we're interacting and engaging with other people and then providing feedback, like bouncing a ball off of each other. You know, I'm seeing what you're doing yeah. and the other person in the room probably has no idea that there's like a charge or an edge that's being surfaced, but we see it in each other and then we have that conversation later and then you get that instantaneous opportunity for growth. I love that you said that. So in coaching, one of the assumptions of this coaching stance is that the other person is naturally creative, resourceful, whole, is not broken, does not need to be fixed. Right. The whole point of a, of a developmental relationship is that we both have these edges where we can say we're actually broken. And yeah. It is that the other person keeps pointing that out, right? 
as an example, right? I'm an angry person. I get angry all of the time, dozens of times a day. And so I'm blind to that. Don't really know what to do it with it. Don't know the impact that it's having on me. But if you're sitting there constantly watching it and monitoring me and say, oh, Michael, you're getting angry. And this means that you're having this impact on the system. That's quite different than a coaching relationship. Yes, I agree. A hundred percent. I think um, it's such an amazing opportunity to be able to have someone in the room do that. But additionally, one of the things that you and I have been doing in the last couple of weeks since we've started talking and working together is the fact that we're sharing those edges. Like we're pointing them out to each other. Here's, here's my weakness. Here's my strength. All of them. I have more than one. <laughs> And I want you to know about them so that when we're working together, that you're watching for them because we see things in each other we don't see in ourselves. That's awesome. And then we also want to point out that in addition to being different than a um, our coaching relationship, it's also different from a friendship. So it's similar in the sense that the two people care deeply about each other. So this is one difference between a developmental relationship and being business colleagues. Um, people, in, uh, people in developmental relationship also enjoy being with each other. Right? So again, also different from a coaching relationship and feel very safe with each other and have high trust with each other. Right? So you know, it's like, like sleep with Maxo. Oh, ah, uh, <laughs> to be with you everywhere, right? Like that's the feeling, right? Like there's a warm, positive feeling, right? When people in a developmental relationship are together. So it's like a friendship, but unlike a friendship, it's incredibly demanding, right? Like the friendship is about like the 99% when we're our best selves, right? It's about the 1% when we're at our edges and being constantly with someone who's saying, oh, you're at your edge, right? That will be uncomfortable at minimum for just about everyone and will often be excruciatingly painful, right? It's excruciatingly painful to hear passionate, you're not listening, you're not patient, right? All of those things in sort of a very clear way over and over again from the same person, even if they care about you enormously. I think, Michael, you and I know each other enough to know that we're both very humble people, right? We, we love to share ourselves and to help others become great but it's always hard to work on yourselves. And the friendship that you're talking about here is a friendship that is something that we're both volunteering and sub submitting to, right? I mean, it's, it's a depth of transparency, humility, and vulnerability that you don't ever walk into a brand new friendship with. Like we're saying, we're, we're, we're going to do this. We're all in. Let's go. Like, let's help each other. That's so, right. yeah. 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 So it's, it's very scary in some sense in that way. It can be scary, I guess. I, I think that this would be scary for a lot of people. I think <laughs> um, as you and I talk through how we want to handle some of the difficulties that we're going to have when we actually do, um, you know, say things to each other that maybe we're, we're currently being triggered or something and maybe not ready to receive something. Those, those abrasions are going to happen, but I'm willing to step through those and try to figure out how to get better as I go through them. Um, other people may be a little uncomfortable with that. So I think you just need to talk about that up front, which um, I know we're going to get to in this presentation later. So. Yeah. And here's how you know you're in a developmental relationship. So think of these markers as something like acceptance criteria for a developmental relationship, but the word acceptance criteria in this context feels a little bit odd. But here are a few things to watch out for to see if you're in a developmental relationship or want to be in one. One is the two people genuinely enjoy being with each other, so it's not work. Um, transparency, openness, vulnerability, um, I have this sort of exercise called hashtag no secrets, where you like sit down and tell the other person a secret, something that you've never told anyone else before. 
witnessing. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, discomfort. If you're not feeling uncomfortable sometimes in a developmental relationship, that means your edges are not being looked at. So if you're looking at your edges, you're going to be uncomfortable. And then, of course, the idea is rapid personal development. So I've been in situations where, like, in a week or two, I see more things about myself than I've seen in a year. The reason for that is pretty straightforward. Like, the whole point, the thing that makes developmental relationships so difficult is that we're blind in our blind spots. We're blind at our edges. So we don't see them ourselves. So it's very difficult for us to actually grow and improve, even if we want to. All this hidden stuff. So when someone else points it out to us, it's just completely new information. And then if they also do it with skill, awareness, and wisdom, it can be very supportive as well. That's why the personal growth happens so quickly. I think a really valid point or something to add to that, Michael, is not just the fact that they're new. Sometimes we know about these things, right? We, we know that we have these emotional charges because of past experiences or past relationships that we've had. But in the moment of something happening, you don't recognize it. Yeah. And so by being vulnerable and transparent with the person that, that you want to work with, like you and I are, are doing here together, we're sharing that with each other. So you know where my emotional charges and edges are so that when I'm in a moment and I can't see it, you're going to recognize it and help me with it. You'll pull me back into, well, I don't want to say reality because I know it's not the right word, but that's what's coming to mind right now. Yeah, pull you back into being Angie. So yeah. the way I think about it, so let's, when I'm angry, I'm completely lost in the anger. Yep. I have no ability to observe myself. And in fact, sometimes I'm explaining to myself why it's correct to be angry. So I can imagine two things if you're there. Number one is that if I'm really doing a massive amount of damage to myself for the system, you might actually say, time out, Michael, let's go for a walk. You might physically remove me from the environment because that might be the best choice at that point. And then the, there would be a conversation afterwards, right? Presumably about it, like what's going on there. And so that's what I meant by sort of witnessing, right? So that's what happens in a developmental relationship. So like one person sort of like stands tall and is clear and can witness, whereas the other person's all tied up and bound up in, in their edge. This person is able to stay there, right? And not get wrapped up in it as well, not go down into the muck, not go, get pulled into the edge. Is able to sit there, allows this person to unfold. It feels like a, like a graceful balance. A graceful balance. Yeah, like a dance. Like a dance. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. So that's a marker. And here's the sequence that we um, see. So the first challenge, it looks like, is to be yourself. And when we say be yourself, we're not saying be yourself. The whole point is there are places where we can't be ourselves, and that's the edge, right? Right? When we're hiding, when we're censoring ourselves, when we're not authentic, that's our edge, right? And then we can nurture each other. So if both of us are interested in this, right, if both of us are interested in being ourselves, we can help each other, nurture each other, lift each other up. Achieving a higher state of consciousness, skill, ability, where, our, where we're able to bring our whole selves, right? We're not being dimmed by our edge, right? That's like the visual image I always have of an edge, right? We have this beautiful, bright star in us, and it's being dimmed by our edge. We can't be seen and we can't fully share ourselves and can't support the system in each other. Get the support from each other, then we can actually crush it. I think that slide almost speaks for itself. Like you, you really just encapsulated everything in the relationship in those, in those points. Yeah. <clears throat> Without the nurturing piece and knowing that you're there to support and to lift that other person up, I don't know that this relationship would be something that could be possible, you know, because you're putting yourself in a vulnerable state you know, and, and entrusting in each other that we're going to be there at our worst moments. And when that isn't going to feel good, 
we need to know that we can trust the other one to pick us back up and build us back up because we need to get rid of those stories and those excuses that we tell ourselves that give us permission to have these edges. Otherwise we'll never get rid of them. Yes. And so I guess I have a comment for agile coaches. I was trying to get clear there for a second <laughs> because I was about to yell to all of my fellow agile coaches and the yell was going to be about, we're asking other people to transform. Yeah should be doing this work ourselves. And so I'm using red language there when I say we should and you know, being somewhat judgmental, but this is the invitation, right? The invitation is to be in a place of growth ourselves continuously all of the time, We're drinking our own champagne. And so we get to experience the fun of being at the edge as well. And then that actually creates empathy for other people who are going through that as well. It's an amazing opportunity, really, if you think about it, because as Agile coaches, one of the things that, that I think we personally gripe about all the time is that leadership wants us to help them transform their organizational culture into these Agile states, but a lot of times leadership isn't willing to actually make changes within themselves. So this is us actually personally demonstrating a way to actually make that possible, that we ourselves have to do exactly what it is that we, what we talk about, what we preach, right? We walk the walk, set an example, model behavior. Um, so I'm really excited to go on this journey. Right. And part of the reason why we're sharing this is that this can be viewed as a practice for yeah. culture shift. And so when I compare this to other practices that I've seen as a manager, as a team member, as an agile coach, I want to just give a sense of the power and the depth of this and the breadth of this. When I think of something like an employee engagement survey, that's, you know, 10 questions once every six months, and then we talk about it for an hour. Versus spending hours a day with a person focusing on edges. This sort of work has been helpful. I've never actually seen that lead to transformation. This practice, the practice of being in a developmental relationship, I have seen. And so thinking about personal growth in the workplace and then creating developmental relationships in the workplace, about everyone in the workplace having a developmental relationship. And think about how that would then transform the organization because we're all constantly looking at our edges. I think that's an amazing insight. And we wanted just to give a couple of examples of developmental relationships from this book, which I find amazing, which is a New York Times bestseller, about um, three people who by their own account grew up under challenging circumstances. And the way they tell the story, they were concerned that they were going to end up in jail, which was what happened to many of their friends. They made a deal with each other to lift each other up and all become medical doctors, and they succeeded in doing that. And they wrote a book called The Pact. And the other one is Howard Stern, who has recently re-emerged and, and is a completely different person. And his interview with uh, Anderson Cooper on CNN recently in which he talks about a relationship that I would call a developmental relationship that he's had primarily with his therapist, but with other people as well, and how he considers himself to be a completely um, different person. They're just examples of developmental relationships and the extraordinary shift that they can actually create. They can actually separate our, us from our histories. Gotta go check out those videos. <laughs> and so I wanted to give an example of something that happened between us. Oh. And I notice I keep using the word I. Are you okay with us sharing this? Yeah, we are sharing it right now. We are sharing it right now. So this is an extraordinary Slack message that Angie sent me after our very first face-to-face -face conversation. Um, I want to just tee this up a little bit by saying that we did have a very significant experience in common before this, which is that we went through the Sahoka Cal 1 and Cal 2. Yeah. We had also spoken on the phone before then. 
And so we were able to have, at least my, my, my perception of the relationship was that it was already in a very safe, very high trust place for me. I was able to share things that I would normally never share in a first conversation, if ever, with you. And then you sent me this description of our conversation. And I also think it's actually a great definition almost of what a developmental relationship looks like, right? It's about vulnerability. It's about speaking the truth to each other. It's about rumbling, which is this great Brene Brown term where she talks about this conversation that comes out of curiosity and a conversation without judgment, love, fear, pain. Yes. So just to go back to the, like the stage that you said, um, yeah. we, had, we had one phone call for a half an hour or an hour. But, but yes, we, we both have been through the Cal 1 and the Cal 2 with Michael and Audrey Fajoda. Um, and the learnings in that class take you to a place of understanding that vulnerability and personal growth and transformation is something that while it, it is hard work, that it is so worth it to go on that, that journey and that path and where you're going to go as you go through that, you have no idea, but you know that it's going to be amazing no matter what's going to happen. And I think, were you going to say something, Michael? I am, but I don't want to interrupt. Okay. Um, so when you and I had the opportunity to actually sit down and, and meet face to face when we were in in Austin at the conference, I think you and I just jumped right into what our paired coaching relationship will work, will look like. And it just opened up everything, you know, here's, here's where I am. Here's where I've been. Here's my strengths. Here's my weaknesses. These are things I need to work on. Here's where I want you to help me. These are things that I think you can challenge me with. And we just kind of did that ball bounce with all of those things back and forth. I don't even know. We, we must have talked for two or three hours, yeah. um, you know, just getting to know each other and laying all of that out there. And it's, it's been super exciting. And I can't even describe um, the amount of work that we've done so far, even though it's been, it's been so fun. You know what I mean? So this up to this point. So I, I imagine it will continue to be, um, but yeah, very exciting. So the, the message that Michael is sharing with you was a few days after we had met, I was still processing this conversation okay. and all of these topics. And it was like, I still needed to be able to come back and talk to you about them and talk through them again, but I needed time to be able to digest everything. Um, and I think we'll probably end up revisiting each one of them again over and over again, because they really are, like you said, the key points of the entire relationship and conversations that we'll continue to have as we go through this. Yes. And what comes up for me when you say that is, how long it's taken me to get to a place where I could have this conversation. So before there was just this huge wall of fear yep. that prevented this sort of intimate conversation. That's the word I would use. A, a developmental conversation is a very intimate conversation. And so there was this wall of fear that would just come up, which I'll just call it ego protection. I don't want to show my defects. I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to say anything that will make me look bad. And what I want to share with everyone is that what's on the other side of it is extraordinary. Yeah. Right? If you can get through that valley, I guess it's a valley. If you can get through that difficult period um, and get to the other side, what's on the other side is an extraordinary feeling of togetherness, oneness, relatedness, it's fulfilling, I'm full of joy, I feel massively supported. That's what's on the other side of that extreme resistance and fear. It's something like the disappearance or disintegration of the ego and then reintegration into something new. I agree and I'm very appreciative. Awesome. And that's, you know, part of the personal growth, right? To grow so that you can be in a developmental relationship. Yep. It's, and, almost, 
it's all doesn't it it almost feels backwards if if you genuinely stop and think about how we've created our relationships with people throughout our entire life you we've done this process the same process that we're doing right now but very slowly like you build that trust and that the ability to be vulnerable with somebody over like an extended period of time you know months years depending on how willing you are to trust other people. Some of us have more issues with trust. I would be one of those. Um, so for us to have talked about and covered as many um, challenges and life experiences as we have had in the last few weeks um, is opposite of anything I've ever experienced. And so we want to end up on what might seem like a negative note, but I don't want to call it negative. It's just a, something very important, something that um, it's very important to acknowledge. I don't think it's negative, Michael. I think it's more of like a, we want to be conscious of the fact that we know that this is something that is going to happen. And yeah. we're, we're sharing the fact that we're trying to find ways to prepare for struggles and, you yeah. know, those types of things that might come up. So. Right. Great, great reframing for me. Previously, we shared this idea of one person witnessing while well, in the struggle and then you go back and forth but what can happen so when this person is in the struggle and this other person's witnessing a way for this person to defend themselves is to attack this person right that's one simple way right and since it's such a close relationship that attack is likely to land right? <laughs> this person knows all of the weaknesses of the other person all of the edges of the other person so just over time, right, in interaction after interaction after interaction, right, we're going to be tired, we're going to be stressed, we're going to have a lot of capacity. There's going to be some time when both of us are like this. And what happens in that moment is essential, right? And so we're both going to be hurt, we're going to, both going to be angry, we're both going to be afraid, we're both going to be sad happens in that moment is critical to determining what not really it's even a developmental relationship. Right? What normally happens in a friendship or in a business relationship is that we drift apart, right? We say, I've had it with you. I'm, yeah. I can't take this pain. Or even my opinion of you has fundamentally changed. And I don't think you're the person that you used to be, right? And so we then drift apart. And so the key thing is, how do we go back in? How do we back in right and stay connected right and use that experience to go deeper fundamental thing how do we use this as a catalyst to make our relationship even deeper <laughs> so the first thing we want to say is like this is going to be normal it's going to happen so figuring out how to create an even greater connection is super important I think something else to say here too is that we're not giving each other permission to act that way. We're just acknowledging the fact that we know that it's going to happen at some point in time. And we want to have that conversation now because we want to be able to discuss what a safe space looks like so that when it does happen, we're prepared for it and we don't revert and pull back that we understand that those are things that we need to go through to be able to step forward. Yes, absolutely. And so, do you want to talk through this slide, Angie? Sure. Um, so, just elaborating on what I just started saying, this slide talks about creating those behavioral guidelines. So, for example, Michael and I have had conversations about um, maybe putting together a safe word. So, let's say that we're we're coaching together. Um, and Michael recognizes a, an edge or a charge from me while I'm actually communicating with somebody and, and actually taking the time to try to give me feedback, but I'm not ready for it because I'm still stuck in that emotional charge. And so no matter how hard he tries to give me feedback, I'm not going to accept it. I'm going to get upset. I'm going to push back. So just having some kind of really simple, easy, safe word between the two of us that we both Nice. It says, hey, I hear you. I know that you're trying to give me feedback and I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I'm not ready for it right now. So let's just take a pause and we'll come back and do this again 
when I'm ready for it. So um, for me, that personally would probably mean me just having a few hours to just kind of like um, get clear, release that energy so that we can actually move on and have a conversation. But that could be different for, for everybody. Um, next one. So here's a list of some questions that I think that people should actually have a conversation around. How do we ensure that we are still being respectful of each other? when we are angry. So if something does happen that triggers an angry um, or fearful emotion, just making sure that we understand each other and how we would feel or how we might react in that situation so that we can re be respectful of both of us um, in that moment. Same thing um, for recognizing triggers within each other and, and then knowing how do we support each other when those un uncomfortable moments come up, you know, recognizing Michael might need to just back off and like not, you know, talk to me for the night. Hey, I just need a break. So let's, let's talk again tomorrow or I need some time alone or maybe he wants to go sit and listen to some music and forget about everything. So whatever that means to each one of us, knowing what those things are ahead of time so that we know how to handle the situation when it comes up and then just remember to remain humble. And if you need to ask for help, it's okay. Michael and I, I'm sure at some point in time are going to have to go back to Audrey and Michael because they both know us both. So they would be great people for us to reach out to, to say, Hey, Michael and I are stuck in something. He said something to me. I don't know how to process it and move past it. Can you please mediate, you know, talk to us, help us help bring us back to where we need to be. So anything you want to add to that? Yes. So I think one thing that you said that was very important that you've done for me, which is extremely helpful, is to say no. And so it's very important to be willing to say no in a developmental relationship instead of just being a doormat or grinning and bearing it. So for me, as a person who puts out a lot of stuff, right, like lots of feedback, lots of ideas, what I'm always concerned about is steamrolling or bulldozing the other person and saying, oh, can you do this? Do you want to work on this? Do you want to work on this? And the other person, in order to be nice, right? And I'm concerned that then that's going to cause them to be resentful and then pull back. Mm -hmm. And then what I do is then I censor myself being open in, anymore in the relationship. So I love it when someone can say no, because then that allows me to just share fully knowing that the other person knows themselves and is able to be self-aware enough and socially aware enough to say, no, 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 no. Here's when I want your thoughts and here's when I don't want your thoughts. Here's when I want to collaborate. Here's when I don't want to collaborate. Also helps stay in connection and reduces the temperature in the system, right? So it's not escalating, escalating, escalating. And then it's a finally a blow up and says, you know, Michael, you're too much. You're <laughs> funding on me too much. You're telling me, giving me too much feedback that I haven't asked for. And then it's this disconnection, right? So saying no in a developmental relationship is actually a sign of health and actually helps to preserve the connection. I think, Michael, talking about saying no, as coaches, it is difficult for us to say no, right? We, our goal, our passion in life is to help others. That's what we want to do. So when we actually do take take the initiative to say no i can't handle anymore no i can't do anymore no i don't have time anymore it's amazing to have somebody respect that too and not push that on you i'm sure we've all had working relationships in the past where you're like i can't i can't i don't have time we'll just fit it in just make it work you know you hear those things um so not just the ability to say no but the fact that both of us are willing to accept it and understand that it doesn't mean that it's not today. It means, you know, Hey, we just, we can't do it right now. You know, we can come back and revisit it again later. So, so yes, I have said no. And thank you <laughs> for accepting it. Um, it's worked out well so far. Fantastic. 